<laughs> the problem is you worry about ever leaving somebody out because that's that's the embarrassing part, you know. I remember one time it really influenced me, and, and uh, I was in uh, Columbia and had just come out of Clive Davis's office, and we were going to go to lunch. And somebody had had an artist or something had put together all of the artists on the Columbia label, little post thumb stamp faces of all these people. <clears throat> and we were just standing there in the hall, and Clive looked over at this picture. I don't remember how many, probably 200 artists or something like that. And he says, I worry about the day if I ever forget one of those names. And I'm like, oh. I mean, I have trouble remembering like 20 names, and here he's talking about 200. So it's amazing what the president of a big major record company goes through. And you know, I've never looked at it like that before. That's a lot of artists. It really is a lot of artists. Well, you have 17 quality artists. Well, we tried to keep it, I guess, on the open. Let's talk about some of the artists that were on the label. Well, in the starting days, I think uh, probably one of the the best building blocks that Stax Records had was probably Rufus Thomas, Rufus and Carla Thomas, uh, father daughter, and uh, they had a, a did a record on them called "Cause I Love You," uh, that did um, pretty well. I think it it did enough, at least what I remember. I didn't play on that particular record, but I was around when it was recorded. And what I remember is the stories went down that, that enough interest was started, you know, through the South and on radio and so forth, that really uh, I gave Atlantic Records, Jerry Wexler and them, an interest into what we were doing down here. And from that led uh, um, to um, Carla Thomas's Gee Whiz and to the, the song on the group that I had in high school, the Marquis, called Last Night. And it was just sort of a, like I said earlier, a, a snowballing effect of, you know, the more successful you were, the more opportunity you had, and the more chances at doing certain things. And obviously, there were a lot of failures. You know, we try to remember all the good times. And, and uh, every now and then, somebody mentioned to me about, wow, Cropper, all, you know, wrote all these great songs and that sort of stuff. And when I look back, I said, well, you know, I probably had maybe 18 top 10 songs, you know. But I wrote probably three, four, five hundred songs. So we don't talk about the failures too often. What was it like working with Booker Oh, it's. I, well, I think Booker, uh, along with what it was like working at Stax, when, when we used to go there, I tell, tell people this all the time without really making it up, it was sort of like going to church every day. You get up in the morning, you take a shower, you get in the car, and I mean, the, the energy started hitting you before you got there. And we, we sort of had a, uh, a standing rule of we, we wanted to start each day around 11 o'clock. And you know how hard it is for musicians to get up. And uh, people like Al Jackson and, and Booker T sometimes, I mean, they were playing some of these clubs that didn't close till 2.30 or 3 in the morning, you know. They were playing that late shift. And for them to go home and just try to catch a few hours sleep and then try to be back at the studio saying, hey, I'm ready to work at 11 was a little difficult sometimes. But I think the whole atmosphere of uh, the guys, like the Memphis Horns and, and people like that, and, and the rhythm section, it was really like going to church. It was just this high energy level. And, and all the guys were waiting for the next one, you know. The thing uh, that... that that sticks in my mind the most is when Otis was going to come to town. I mean, the week before Otis came, the whole, that whole building was just vibrating. It was amazing. Everybody couldn't wait. Say, Otis is coming in next week. Wow, you know. Because in those days, we were churning them out pretty good. Sometimes we were working with two, three artists a week and trying to cut three or four, five songs a day sometimes, and, you know, like on a double shift sort of a situation. And because of the demand. And we were trying to do it with all of this same group, you know, like with seven guys in the room playing. And uh, uh, it was, there were a lot of artists like that, a lot of, a lot of energy kind of things. It was always fun when, when Eddie Floyd came in to, you know, to work again and stuff like that. And we had some good moments with some outside people, like when uh, Wilson Pickett came down, we did some good things on him. So uh, it was always kind of uh, some interesting, fun things going on at Stacks, even though it was business too. Where did the title Green Onions come from? Well, <laughs> Green Onions. Um, I think the original title, we had, uh, the story that, about that whole song is, is too long to tell because I'm about to run out of breath. Uh, we had cut this sort of blues instrumental. And uh, Jim Stewart thought it was good enough to, to maybe give it a, a shot at a record. 
and uh, he said, gosh, he said, you guys, he said, you, you know, this is really good. He said, have you got anything that you can put on, the, you know, as a B-side? So uh, Booker and I said, well, we've been working on this little riff, and we had Booker had this little riff on the organ that he'd been playing, and we'd kind of piddle around with it off and on for a couple of weeks. I mean, we're not really spending any time on it. We said, we got this little riff, and he said, well, let's hear it. So we did the little thing, and the guys worked it up, and uh, uh, Jim said, well, it's pretty good if we just take the guitar thing in the middle and put it on the front and, and do an instrumental and so forth, and that's what we did. So the guitar thing in the middle wound up to be the intro, <clears throat> and then we did the two verses, and I did a solo, and Booker did the thing out, and, and we went with it. And uh, that happened to turn out to be the song Green Onions. But when we went in to, to listen back, he said, well, it's, we really got something here. He said, we need to title these things. He said, what is the, the funkiest, you know, down, grittiest, you know, thing you can think of? And I, Louis Steinberg, I just was sitting there, and he says, onions. He said, onions are about the stinkingest, funkiest thing I can think of. So I said, onions, I don't know, and we hashed it around for a minute, and then somebody, I don't know if it was Booker or Al Jackson or who, who came up with it. It could have been me, it could have been, could have been anyone else. I really don't remember, but somebody said, well, let's clean it up and call it green onions, you know, because green onions are pretty healthy, too, you know, they're pretty stinky. And uh, as it went, well, by, by the time the record came out, we wound up flipping the sides. So the, the blues ballad wound up to be the B-side, and the dance one wound up to be what we now know to be as green onions. Was it your first big hit? On the label or as an No. I think, well, I guess Green Onions um, was the first actual million seller, if I remember correctly, for stacks. We had had, like I said earlier, we had a record called Last Night, which was, I don't know, a number. It, I don't know if it ever went to number one on Billboard, but it went to like two or three. And then Green Onions was the first song that went, I think it went number one across the board on most of the, the trade magazines at that time. Why'd you move to LA? <clears throat> oh, I don't know. I think um, I basically just in search for something different, I think. Um, I, I stayed, I left Stax um, for just certain reasons. You know, I really, really can't get into why I left there or whatever. I just wasn't comfortable there anymore. Um, I'd been there for 10 years and all of a sudden it just didn't seem, you know, the the old thing wasn't there anymore for some reason, and I made a decision to leave. It was very difficult to leave, and uh, I stayed here for a while and um, got with the, uh, another guy and um, started a label, you know, with another recording studio and so forth, and we tried that for a while. Uh, we put a lot of energy into it and so forth, and I don't know, I was a little frustrated, I think. Um, I wasn't really tired of what I was doing. I really did want to stretch out. I definitely wasn't tired of what I was doing. I mean, R&B will always be my life till the end. But I did. Try, we tried to mix it up a little bit and do some songs that were a little more pop, you know, aren't it? and uh, with moderate success. And it just wasn't enough to hold things together, you know. And I really just didn't feel like. Um, I don't know, staying and trying something new here again. And I, I just thought it was time for me to, to go somewhere else. There's a possibility I may come back. I don't know, you know. That's, I've always had that in the back of my mind. That's, and another thing I've always predicted that, that Memphis will always survive itself in the music industry. It always has. Uh, it always cycles around somehow. We never know when or where. It's sort of like, how can you predict when a volcano is going to erupt? Um, but it's, uh, I think, on its way back now. I think right here, 85 now, going into 86, I think we're going to see a major upswing of, of Memphis talent again, Memphis songs, Memphis music. You know, and I'm very supportive of that whole situation. Is there, a, is there, or was there ever a Memphis sound particularly? I th well, I guess there was. Um, when you say Memphis sound, that's what it got pegged with, I guess. It was, a, it was a certain sound of music, certain style of music that people identified. Well, you know, the buying public also as well. But I think it was mainly what disc jockeys referred to. I mean, they're sitting there all day long spinning, you know, songs and records from all over the world. <clears throat> and, I mean, without even listening, they could hear two bars or four bars of a song and they'd say, wow, that was cut in Memphis. The same as they could with a Detroit record and, and so forth like that. So I guess for a while, yeah, we had a Memphis sound. Um, a lot of people have asked through the years, what, what is the Memphis sound? And 
God only knows what the Memphis Sound was. I mean, the Memphis Sound was the result of a, of a lot of hardworking people that really had a, a, just a, a devout love for this business. The, the thrill of, of having a song recorded and having it played on the radio and having people go out and buy it, you know. It was just an inner love. It really was, it wasn't the money at all, you know. Success, obviously, I mean, that just builds upon itself. But it was just the, you know, just the heart and soul of a lot of dedicated people that created the Memphis Sound. Do you think it has a, a lot to do with, with uh, having, having it come from musicians that had more emotion than training? <clears throat> well, I think so. I think it was a, a reaching out of people wanting to express themselves. I think you find that true in a, in a lot of areas where a musician is highly trained that has really studied his craft, that's really researched his music, you know, and really knows what he's doing, winds up sometimes finding it very difficult to express himself. He's got all these tools, and it's like, wow, you know. And I think it's, it's easier to express yourself, you know, when you've got a drum and a stick, you know. You've got two things to bang on instead of a hundred things to bang on. And I, th I think that reaching out for, you know, uh, to express yourself, that's what they call art. You know, to some people, it's an art form. And uh, I think Memphis was very fortunate to have that caliber of people running around this town wanting more than anything to express themselves. I think that's why so many great artists came out of Memphis, Tennessee. The thing when you say artists, that's, that's who we know is the individual who sang the song and did it. I think they were also fortunate to have such great people on the underground pushing them and really, really backing them, not using them, you know. That's happened in a lot of areas, too, where certain people in, in positions and in power can influence. And they were actually using people a lot of times. You know, that's some of the bitter part of the business. In Memphis, it didn't happen so often. I mean, there was such a love. It was such a family with everybody. I mean, everybody cheers when another guy has a hit record. You know, they're not really jealous. They were just proud, you know, as though they did it themselves. So. That's rare. Yes, it is rare. I think, I think that it would be very difficult. Or do you think it would be, it's, it's more difficult for kids starting out today? It seems like you guys had a lot of time to play and make mistakes and and go on. It seems like today kids are faced with, the first thing they're faced with is the video. And it doesn't seem to me like they have that much opportunity to make mistakes and grow. <coughs> well, that's very true. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of times in some of the sessions we did, if the camera had been rolling, <laughs> we may have never made it, you know, I don't know. It is very difficult. Uh, there's a whole new era coming up. I mean, the, the kids out there are obviously being influenced by what they see on the screen and not necessarily what they hear. Um, it also creates a lot of difficulty in a lot of areas. It's, it's, a, it's a new ball game out there. In terms of is it harder today for up and coming new talents to make it based on the information that we have and whatever I mean there's more people so there's there's obviously more to pick and choose from um, in terms of I, I think you mentioned something about a chance to make more mistakes or whatever the kids today have more information to pick from I mean a lot of the information we had we had to make up because it wasn't available uh, I mean, there were, it took forever before you hardly got liner notes on the back of an album, let alone the lyrics and who did it and who played on it and what studio and who engineered it and all that sort of stuff. It just wasn't available in the days that we came up. So uh, in, in terms of actually making it, it's like anything else. It's, I, if you've got the will you know, and the desire to do it, there ain't nothing going to stop you. And that's, that's how you know, talent is made. Who are you listening to? Oh boy. <laughs> uh, that's really hard to say. There, there are so many um, good records out there, good musicians. There's so much talent running around. I mean, there's some of the new stuff that's coming out of England and some of the new stuff that's coming out of America, I think is phenomenal. I think it's just advanced itself right out there. It's amazing, you know. I don't have anything particular in mind that I could pick from. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are people out there that take, I think, a lot of liberties and maybe sometimes too much. I think they forget that there are roots in this business. You know, there, there was a starting point. There, you know, 
There are, there are no rules in this business, but I think you know, there, there are certain guidelines that holds the industry together somehow. It's sort of, sort of like the earth. The industry sort of takes care of itself. And it's always going to be up and down. You know, one minute everybody panics, oh my God, this is it, uh, you know, nothing's selling. And the next minute it's so much happening that, you know. Uh, I don't envy, you know, the, the record companies today that have to sit down and design a budget to where they have to come up from anywhere from seventy-five to $100,000 to do a video when, you know, 25 years ago it was decided upon as whether they would spend anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars to make an album. I mean that's that's come a long way. So it's a lot of there's a lot of pressure out there on the guys that, you know, call the shots on who gets the big bucks and who doesn't, you know. It's a different business, but it's still the record business. What's Steve Cropper doing in nineteen eighty five, eighty six? Oh, kinda having a ball, you know. Um, I think I made a major decision for my career, uh, at least to 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 get back to my roots. Uh, I made a decision about a year and a half ago to really uh, spend some time to get back to writing because I really think that's what I do best. Uh, you had mentioned earlier about you know what comes first, the chicken or the egg. You know, is it the guitar? Is it the writing? Is it whatever? <clears throat> I really think, for me, I think it's the writing. And uh, I'm, it, my own feelings, I'm not sterile by any means. I, I got into doing a lot of production um, after the you know when I left Stax back in uh, the early 70s. Uh, I had a lot of opportunity to work with a lot of artists to produce a lot of records and it really took a lot of my time and I, I almost got out of the writing business except on a rare occasion when I would chip in and help write this or write that. And now it's a little bit different. I've sort of stopped uh, a lot of the production, sort of the, like I say, the mass production doing four or five albums a year, uh, to writing songs and songs that I believe in and having fun with. And uh, so far I'm very happy with what's been going on. You got it? It was pretty painless, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. I think Doug's right. Doug's right.